Good morning. You guys doing okay? Good. Are you? I'm like, yeah, three of you are doing good. Great. Hey, my name's Ty. I'm one of the pastors here. It is good to be with you this morning. Before we get kicked off, uh, again, we have a book of the month, and we really want to promote uh, a good book to read each and every month. As disciples, disciples means a learner or pupil or student, and so we want to be learners, and so we want to put good books in front of you. And so this month's selection is The Tech Wise Family, Everyday Steps for Putting Technology in Its Proper Place. We promoted this last week and sold out of every copy we had, and so we got more in there, there at Centerpoint. Um, basically, how to help us as people living in modern times with modern technologies such as screens on iPads, phones, TVs, and whatnot, uh, how to manage those properly in our lives and our family's life to where we don't just go back to the Stone Ages and throw them all away, but we don't go so far forward that we are just uh, sucked in by them and they consume our life. And so pick up this book. You can read it in a few hours. It's really, really good. All right, let's get started. There are a few absolutes in life, a few guarantees in life, but one thing is for sure is this. Someone will hurt you. Someone will offend you. Someone will rip you off. Someone will not treat you kindly. Someone will not treat you well. Someone will hurt you. It may be a stranger, maybe someone you do not know, but more than likely, it'll be someone you know, and more than likely, it'll be someone that you love deeply and presumably deeply love you. It may be a spouse. It may be a family member, mom, dad, brother, sister, maybe a friend, a coworker. But nonetheless, you're going to get hurt. I'm going to get hurt. We are going to hurt. And so the question is, what do we do when we get hurt? And by the way, what do we do when we hurt other people as well? Because that's another guarantee of life too, isn't it? Well, we're continuing our series called The Long Story Short, where we've been walking through the parables of Jesus. And in these parables, these stories that Jesus tells, what Jesus is doing is really breaking it down to us, really putting the cookies on the bottom shelf for us to help us understand very significant, eternal, spiritual matters, kingdom of God matters in our life. And so he takes the normal, ordinary things of life, the normal, ordinary people of life, and he really uses these stories to create big truths in our life. And today, we're going to look at this parable called the unforgiving servant. And you'll find it in Matthew chapter 18. So if you have a Bible, go to Matthew chapter 18. If you do not own a Bible, we want to give you one. It's a gift from us. And so we have two versions of it out at Centerpoint, English and Spanish, whichever one is best for you. So just walk by and grab that. We also put the scripture on the screen for you. And we have the Grace Point Vegas app. It's on your smartphone. You can download it for free. It has a full Bible as well for all you modern tech people out there that don't like the old analog Bible called paper. Let's go. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 18. And I've got to do a little bit of setup work so we understand what's going on within the text. Um, right before we get to this parable... There's a section where Jesus instructs us, how do we deal with Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you're a Christian here today, if you're not a Christian, this would be good for you to listen to this as well, because I'll talk to you in just a moment. But for Christians, how do we handle when someone hurts us? And if you're familiar, if you have a lot of church background, if you've been in church for a long time, this text, before we're, the text we're preaching on today, is commonly referred to as the church discipline text. You, maybe you've heard it, Matthew 18, or the church excommunication for some big words text. Uh, but basically what the text, what Jesus is telling us is when another Christian sins against you, what should you do? Well, you go to them by yourself and you say, hey, you've done this to me, and you want them to turn from it. You want them to repent from it. If that doesn't work, then you take a couple more Christians with you. If that doesn't work, then you kind of bring the church with you. And then if that doesn't work, then at that time, then you, you send them out. You put them out of the church. It may seem like a very unloving thing, but the Bible shows us it's actually a very loving thing. Now, the question you're probably asking in your mind is this. Well, is, is Grace Point Church one of those church disciplining churches? Well, we are a church of the Bible. We are a church of Jesus. And so we do what the Bible says. And so we are. You, you, you see, Grace Point Church, our whole mission comes from the Bible, and our mission here is to make disciples. Make disciples of who? Jesus. So we want to make disciples of Jesus that live in community. That means we live together, 
but we also live for the community around us. Make sense? And so as disciples, we have these discipling relationships. And as you're a disciple, as I'm a disciple, and we live in these discipling relationships, there's always discipling going on. And you notice there's discipling and discipline are kind of in the same word genre, right? And so in these discipling relationships, we're not looking how can we oust one another? How can we be the sin Gestapos in one another's lives, peering through each other's windows, you know, aha, caught you doing this. That's not what our responsibility is to do. Our responsibility is to build one another up with the word of God. Our responsibility is to love one another. Our responsibility is to correct one another at times when it's needed. You need that. I need that. And so if you were to ask, well, it's Grace Point Church, a church discipline church, It's happening all the time within the discipling relationships here at Grace Point Church. One-on-one people going to one another, hey, when you said this, this is kind of what you meant by this, and this is what's going on, that really offended me. Or, hey, when that happened, that happens within the context of our community. And so that's what's going on in the text before the text. And that's very important to know that that's what's going on in the text before the text. Because When Jesus explained that, he had people around him hearing that, and one of the guys that heard that, his name was Peter. Peter's very well known within the Bible. Peter was like a close follower of Jesus, and Peter hears this, and so he starts thinking like, oh, so we're supposed to forgive people. How many times are we supposed to forgive someone? And that's where our text begins, Matthew chapter 18, 21. Then Peter come up and said to him, being Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. And here's the, here's the reason, because we got to ask, why is Peter asking that question based upon the text before it? And here's the reason why I think Peter asked that question, the same reason why we asked the question. He asked this question of Jesus of, basically, when Jesus said, this is how you handle someone who has sinned against you, this is what, how you handle someone who has hurt you, and Peter's asking, what if it actually works? that you actually go to the person that offended you and they seek forgiveness. How many times am I supposed to forgive them? Because what if it actually works? Because, you know, forgiveness sounds great in theory, right? So you actually have to use it and do something with it. I love what C.S. Lewis said. He said this, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. We're like, yeah, man, I'd love a good message on forgiveness until someone actually hurts you and then you have to go through the process. And so Peter, being a good Jewish boy as he was, in that time period, in that context, in that culture, he knew that kind of in a legal way, he had to forgive someone if they asked for forgiveness three times. That was kind of the, the deal back then, that you, you, know, you had three strike rule. If you asked for forgiveness three times, past that third one, then, then game on. Like you didn't have to forgive him anymore. And so Peter, just, if you just kind of look at Peter's life, he's always putting his foot in his mouth. He's always taking and saying things, you know, well-meaning maybe, but just kind of off, off base, kind of like us as well. He says, well, I'll ask Jesus seven times because that's three doubled and I'll add one for good measure and seven's a big number within the Bible perfection. And so he's like, what about... What about seven times, Jesus? Once I forgive someone seven times, can I not forgive them after that? Which I love when a question brings about more questions in our mind. And I think that question brings more questions in our mind. Do, maybe the question, do we have to forgive people? How many times do we forgive people? The, the, the uh, vernacular of our landscape is forgive and forget, right? You ever had someone tell you to forgive and forget, and someone's hurt you really bad, and someone looks at you and almost insensibly, but maybe well-meaning. They say, hey, just forgive and forget. That's the way. Is that really the way? Can you really forget? There's a lot of wounds, a lot of scars, a lot of damage, trauma that happens. It's not so easy to forget. So the cool thing is Jesus answers. Look at verse 22. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times. I bet in that moment, Peter's like, "Uh uh-oh. Jesus is about to be all Jesus on me right now. I do not say to you seven times, but 77 or seven times seven is the way the text usually reads it. Seven times, seven times. I'm sorry, seven times 70. Now, in our minds, if we're not careful, here's what we think. We think about, you know what, I'll put that list of that person I'm in close proximity with. And I'll put their name on a list and put it on the refrigerator and I'll put check boxes all the way up to 490 because that's seven times 70, right? I didn't have to take my shoes off for that math. Seven times, you know, 70, 490. And I'll check it off, check it off. And once they get to 490, I'll check that off. And here comes 491. Boom, I wad the list up and it's game on. I'm not gonna attack them. I'm not gonna forgive them. Is that the way it works? What Jesus is saying right here, I don't think he means that. 
think what Jesus is commanding Peter and us as well is to stop counting and start forgiving, that we forgive. A Christian must forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive. Pause, pause, hold that thought. So we just forgive? No matter the pain, no matter the hurt, no matter the severity of what someone has done to us, no matter if they didn't even respond to it with asking for forgiveness or turning from it. You, you, you mean we're just supposed to forgive? Pause. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Cool thing what Jesus is getting ready to do, uh, Jesus doing his Jesus thing, he's going to tell us a story. He's going to give us a parable, and I think it's going to help us out with that today. So let's keep reading in verse 23. Here's the parable. Jesus says, therefore, he goes right into this parable. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. Now, let's see if you've been listening. If you've been with us for a while, if you're new here, then you can kind of come on board with us now. But um, if you've been here for a while, I said within the parables, we see three themes emerge over and over and over through the parables. Remember those three themes? Which theme is this right here in this parable? It's right in the text. It starts with the, word, the letter K. The letter K to you is brought, by, brought to you by, you ready? Kingdom. This is a kingdom theme. And so Jesus is saying, within my kingdom, within my realm, within those who follow me, and, I, and Jesus is the king and you are my servant, within that realm, this is how life is to be lived out now. That's what he's saying. So this is a kingdom thing. So the king in the story represents God. The servants represent the people within his kingdom. And what he's saying, he said this last parable last week, he's saying this parable as well is the king is going to call in his accounts. And what we had said is our life is on loan from God, and what you do right now in your life matters. Your life right now. It's not just run out the clock, die, and go to heaven. Your life right now matters, what we talked about last week. And so the good thing is God's going to call into account our lives, and thanks be to Jesus that Jesus lived a perfect life on our behalf, died a death on the cross in our place because we deserve that death, and came back to life. And when we trust Jesus, that's what makes us Christians, we swap that. And so when God calls account with us, he sees the perfect life of Jesus. That's called good news. That's the gospel. That's good news of the gospel. So let's keep going. Verse 24. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. How much is 10,000 talents? Well, just know in the Greek language, the highest numeral they had was 10,000. That's, that's what they knew was 10,000. That's the highest they can go. And, and uh, a talent is a measurement of weight. Now, usually when the, they would talk about a talent, they meant of precious metal like gold or silver, and so if a ton is about 2,000 pounds, this 10,000 uh, talents that he owed was 375 tons of gold or silver. Or to put it in their common day language, uh, that much weight of gold or silver would be 60 million days wages. Or to put it in, in our vernacular, that is called a buttload of money. Bum load, sorry. Some of you are like, I don't want my kids saying that, sorry. <laughs> or we can just say a gazillion dollars. The reality is it's a debt that can't be paid off. It's a, it's a debt that can never be paid. If you were to work it off, it would cost you 60 million days worth of work. 60 million. So this is what Jesus continues. He, Since he could not pay... Duh. His master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and a payment to be made. And so that was common back in that day. You were in trouble because you could not pay back your debt and they would start selling possessions, even yourself, even your family off. And any money they could incur would help pay off some of your debt, but it would not pay off the whole debt. So this is what he did. So verse 26, so the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, begging him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. Impossible, right? We said 60 million days worth of wages. No one could pay that. He was going to have to pay that off literally forever. I mean, like forever, forever and ever and ever. The debt was too large. And so the only thing he could do was throw himself at the mercy of the king. That was it. Look at verse 27. And out of what? Pity. Out of pity, which pity means compassion. Just out of 
compassion, out of love, out of a nurturing sense and care, out of pity for him, the master of the servant, released him and forgave his debt. Huh. That's pretty cool. Notice the text says release and forgave. That's what forgiveness really is. It's, it's a release. You, you see, the king was just and right to call the account in. The king was just and right to get all of his money back one way or another. That's just and right, to throw him and his family into prison forever, just and right. He was right to do that, and yet he didn't. He had mercy on him, and he, he relieved him. He forgave him. Now, I said earlier that no one could pay this debt off. I take that back. Someone could pay that debt off. The person who had the money in the first place can pay that debt off. You know how the person will do that? By canceling the debt. But the person who had that money, that 375 tons of gold or silver, the person who had that, they have to do what? They have to absorb the loss. You can't just wipe that off the books, right? It doesn't work that way. No, they have to absorb the loss. And that's what happens. When you forgive a debt, when you release someone, someone has to absorb the loss. And so when you're hurt, when someone sins against you, you will probably have to absorb the loss. And in that moment, you are identifying with Jesus because he absorbed the loss when it came to our sin. And so the lesson drawn from here is we need to be like this servant. We are like the servant. We're in the deepest possible debt to God. And like the servant, we can't come close to paying our debt. And therefore, like the servant, our only mode of transportation to do with all this is to fall on our knees and beg for mercy from God. So here comes our themes again. What theme is this that God has pity? What's that theme? Remember, I said three things. We've already talked about kingdom. What's the next one? Grace. That's grace. He didn't earn it. He didn't deserve it. I mean, you think about it. Uh, the debt we owe, it's not that it's just a significant amount. It's an unworldly amount. When you think about our sin debt against God, it's an otherworldly amount that we couldn't pay even if we tried to. It's not like it's just a gazillion dollars that separates us from God. It's in a gazillion mile chasm that separates us from God. And even in our best efforts, even with our best work, even with our best budgets, even with our best of our best of our best religion, we cannot bridge the gap in our chasm. The only thing we can do is cling to that old, rugged, colossal cross. That's our only hope, a cross deeper and wider and vaster than what we could ever imagine. I mean, the cross of Christ is deeper and wider and vaster than you can ever dream or imagine, and that's no exaggeration whatsoever. And so within this parable, think about the servant. The servant has experienced the forgiveness of the king. The, the servant has experienced the forgiveness and the release of a debt that he could not pay, that his whole family was going to have to pay for, that he had to live off forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, right? I mean, you would imagine in that situation when someone received something such, so valuable as that, it would be so easy for them to go give it to other people as well, right? To be extremely merciful to other people, right? They've experienced this great mercy from heaven, this great mercy from the king. Of course, it'd be obvious if they would go give that forgiveness and that release and that mercy to everyone else, right? Well, let's see. Verse 28. You know I'm setting you up for this, right? It's Jesus. He's doing it in the text. So. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii and seized him. He began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. Well, that didn't last long. <laughs> he went out and found him, which when you find someone, you must be looking, right? So he literally, in this, in this story here, it's like he turned away from the king's present. He's like, where's that guy that owes me 100 bucks? You know, kind of deal. And, starts, and finds him, which, you know, that's, that's a big amount of money. That, that 100 denarii would be about four months worth of wages, and so, like, we would all feel the pinch in that. It'd be hard to put food on the table and keep the lights on for sure. But it's not like this insurmountable thing. And so he goes out to him and starts to choke him and says, where's my money? It's crazy. It's like he can receive forgiveness, but he can't give forgiveness. Who does that? We do, don't we? Let's just be honest. 
We, we do this. We, do, we laugh at this parable like, what a jerk. I'm glad I'm not like him. <laughs> if you weren't like him, there'd be no need of a cross. But here's a reality. We are like him and more. And so there's a, a need for the cross. Listen, the desire for revenge and bitterness and grudge holding and account tabulating is deep, deep inside of each and every one of us. We want ours. We want owed with us, and we want to hurt those who have hurt us, and we do not want to give mercy. That's deep inside of each and every one of us. Let's keep going. Verse 29. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have mercy with me, and I will pay you. Does that sound familiar? Same thing the first guy said. Same thing. Even owed him less money. Same thing. What did he do? Verse 30. He refused. He refused. This is a side note, just a thought. There's power in refusing forgiveness to other people. And sometimes we want to hold that power to dear life. We want to have power over people. You did this to me. And we hold that power. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. He refused to release him and forgive him. And look at verse 31. When his fellow servants, so these people around, when they saw what was happening, what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. (laughs) You know, they're sitting back being like, who's that guy I think he is? Did he just not get that debt forgiven for him? And now he's beating this, this dude up for like 100 bucks? Crazy. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Busted. The guy's busted. Verse 32. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had had mercy on you? The answer is, yes, you should have. Yes. And in anger, anger, in just, righteous, perfect anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all of his debt. How long will it take him to pay 60 million days worth of debt? Forever. All right, remember our themes. We've seen the theme of kingdom. We've seen the theme of grace. What theme is this right here? Judgment. Judgment. What Jesus is talking about, and I think what Jesus is alluding to a lot in his parables, is hell, eternal separation from God. That's what he's talking about. And just so we make sure we interpret this uh, parable correctly, Jesus lays it out for us in verse 35. So also, my heavenly Father will do to, to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. If you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So the way of Jesus is forgiveness, and we forgive, and we forgive. So go forgive everyone who's wronged you. Go forgive everyone that's hurt you. Go on, go. Go do that now. It's not that easy, is it? How do we forgive them? When do we forgive them? How many times do we forgive them? What about reconciliation? What, how do I forgive them when they live with me, and I've got to be with them forever? What about those that have hurt me so badly there's no way to reconcile or come back from that, right? What about those who have abused me and I can't even get around them anymore because I'm so fearful of the abuse? What about those who have abused me? What about those who have hurt me and wronged me that are no longer with us, passed away, and yet the pain is still with me? What do we do about them? What about those who have hurt me with no remorse, no care, no compassion towards me? Look, the way of Jesus is to forgive. And I think the text helps us. Let me land on the text before we go anywhere else. Verse 35. Jesus says, forgive your brother from your heart. And I think looking at other scripture to kind of, you know, how how do you interpret scripture? You interpret scripture with other scripture. I think from this, um, the forgiveness from the heart is that we have an attitude, a posture, a readiness to forgive people. And so what I want to do is um, I, I want to take with our, the time we have here and help us develop a foundation for forgiveness. Help us figure out practically how can we have a heart, a posture for forgiveness. Uh, be, because if we're not careful, if we, if we do not forgive or if we do not have a heart of forgiveness, 
then we'll, we'll, we'll allow a root of bitterness. And bitterness, I heard one person say bitterness is this. Bitterness is drinking poison, expecting the other person to die. And what it will do is start to eat us alive and it start to enslave us and start to kill us is what it will do. And, and so I'm gonna lay a simplistic as best I can, an ideal world, biblical as well, uh, foundation for forgiveness. Now here's what's gonna happen. There's a lot of nuances. You're gonna say, well, what about this situation? Well, in my situation, this happened. What about when this happens? What about X, Y, Z or whatever that looks like? I cannot, in the time allotted, walk through each and every situation. But I will say this, with this foundation, I think you'll have the starter tools um, to, to guard your heart from bitterness, to guard your heart from a posture, a heart of unforgiveness, that I think as we do this will help create joy in Jesus with us and, and love towards one another and a reality to where we can have a heart of forgiveness that Jesus talks about. So I'm going to be um, extremely technical and practical right now. You might want to write some of this down because some of you may be like, well, I'm fine. I don't need to forgive anybody right now. There's a guarantee in life. Eventually you will. Or you may be a little bit, and I say this lovingly because I am too sometimes, you may be a little bit clueless and you are the one that has offended someone and you need to go ask for forgiveness. And so this will work from both sides of that coin. Okay. Um, I got a lot of help with this from uh, Pastor Tim Frazier, the bearded one. There's wisdom in that beautiful mane of his. As long uh, as, as well with Gary Brashears, uh, Dr. Gary Brashears, for the professor of systematic theology at Western Seminary in Portland, Oregon, he kind of helped me with this. So uh, let's look at the Bible, and then we'll talk about this. Luke chapter 17, verses 3 and 4, Jesus gives this very punchy statement about for forgiveness. Luke 17, 34, he says this, Pay attention to yourself. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. As, uh, and if he sins again against you seven times in the day <laughs> and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, what do you must you do? You must forgive him. So let me give you some stage one to help you foundation. Stage one, number one, you ready? Watch yourself. Who does the text say pay attention to? Who does the text say pay attention to? Yourself, Why? Because when someone hurts us, what do we first notice? Our hurt. We're like, ouch, that hurts. That's painful. And so when we are hurt, a lot of times we give ourselves permission at that moment to go hurt other people. I heard this a long time ago, hurt people hurt people. I mean, think about some regret you have in your life. You probably regret saying something. You probably regret doing something. Now, think back on what was the situation and circumstances of you saying and doing something that, that you really regret against someone else. Might it have been when someone hurt you, you and I, we do this, we, we give ourselves crazy permission to go hurt other people and we'll say, well, if they, if, they, if they would have done that to me, then I wouldn't have done these things. If they didn't say that to me, I wouldn't have done these things. And yet we're still responsible for ourselves, right? We're still responsible for our reactions. And I think this text is very important. Jesus said, watch yourself. Because if we're not careful, listen to me. If we're not careful when we're hurt, we easily become the victim. And you may be the victim, but we want to see ourselves as the innocent victim. And in your situation, you may be the innocent victim. But in the grand scheme of life, we're not as innocent as we think we are. Maybe in that situation, that situation you maybe have nothing to do and someone really hurt you. So I'm not, but I'm talking about in the grand scheme of life. And what we want to do is we want to make a, a, a victim of ourselves and a villain out of the people who hurt us. We need to have a bigger picture of ourself. I mean, remember our sin against God. Remember that we are sinners as well. This is not a long time ago. You might remember this. The parable we just went through Remember the parable we just went through? Like, there, there's a large amount that you've been forgiven before God. That's that's true story, right? We've been forgiven against God. See, what we want to do is we want to exclude ourselves from that and be like, no, they hurt me. Well, we're, we are, we're villains as well at times. Uh, Miroslav Volf said it like this, forgiveness flounders because I exclude the enemy from the community of humans, even as I exclude myself from the community of sinners. Please don't out-sin their sin, out-hurt their hurt. 
And by the way, your hurt may be legit, but make sure we don't get confused. Don't, don't be confused on being inconvenienced in a traumatic situation. Because, you know, being inconvenienced is they didn't get the right pumps of mocha in your latte, and they put uh, soy milk in there, God forbid, instead of regular milk. And we're like, oh my gosh, I can't, I'm so hurt by that. And we go on some kind of rant on, you know, boycott Starbucks on Facebook or whatever. Like it's the major tragedy. It, look, that's being adult. Being adult is dealing with inconveniences. It really is. Make sure we don't confuse that with like real trauma, real, like that's sin against me. That's, that's hurt. So number one, watch yourself. Number two, you're going to hate this one. Talk to them. What does the text say? It says, pay careful attention to yourself. If your brother sins, what's that word right there? Rebuke. You, you have to talk to them. And when we hear that, we're like, I don't want to talk to them. That's half the problem. They hurt me. I no longer, I want them to not exist anymore. You are dead to me now because you hurt me. We'd never say that out loud, but that's probably what's going on in our heart. See, this means you're going to have to talk to them. And again, we don't want to out sin their sin. And here's what we do. This is a breeding ground for a sin called gossip. Because we'll, we need to rally the troops around us because we're the victim, remember? And we gotta rally the troops around us and say, hey, can you believe they did that to me? Can you believe they said that to me? Can you believe them? And then we'll do like this because we wanna hear all of our you know, little cohort over here so we can go out with the pitchforks and torches against them because they're the big villain. Listen to me. Don't talk about them. Talk to them. That is the way of Christ. That's gonna take some maturity on your part. That's a mature Christian move right there. Talk to them. Uh, Augustine, or Augustine, depends on where you're from, he had this sign above his kitchen table that said this. He who speaks evil of an absent man or woman is not welcome at this table. I love that. I love that. Look, go talk to them, and here's the words you need to use. I love you. But when you did this, you hurt me. When you did this, it's painful to me. When you did this, you sinned against me. So talk, you have, you, you, you've got to, you have to talk to them. Now, here's a little bit of a caveat. If it's abusive, if it's hurtful, you might not want to get in front of them. It might be wise not to. You might need to bring back up with you. Your church family, law, the law, it's there for a reason. Don't be abused. Get some help. Let us know. If you're in an abusive situation, I'm kind of a side note. If you're in an abusive situation, let us know. We, we've been alerted to those situations before. We, we, we're, we're your family. We want to we help. So there may be some wisdom in that. Watch yourself. Talk to them. And number three, start the forgiving process. The Bible tells us, and I think Jesus is telling us right here, that we are to have a forgiving heart. But we might not always be able to forgive. I want you to think about this. You might have to mull on this for a while. Before you send me an email like, well, I don't know about that, Ty. I want you to mull on it and read the Bible. And please don't answer this out loud. I'm going to ask a rhetorical question. Does God always forgive? The biblical answer is no. No. I mean, we're not universalists that believe that God will just forgive everybody and just cover over everything because Jesus died on the cross. You must ask for what? The Bible is repentance. You must ask for forgiveness. You must ask. You must ask. Romans 10. I mean, I can walk through a whole lot on that. Does God always have a posture to forgive? Yes. Yes. He's made, he's made it possible to forgive because of all that Christ has done. It's the greatest posture in the world. There's a cross that shows us that God is posturing himself to forgive, that we're no longer enemies, but we can be friends. That we're no longer orphans, we can be sons and daughters because the greatest posture of God is the cross. So what does the forgiveness process look like for us? Um, this is going to, I'd call this stage two. This is kind of long and lengthy. I'm going to do my best to walk through this quickly. Let me, let me set some text up, and we'll walk through this. You might want to write this down. This, 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 is gold. this is relational gold right here. Colossians 3, 12. 
Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Boy, there's a lot of identity statement there we need to wash ourselves in. Holy and beloved. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Interesting enough, Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, goes there first before he goes to forgiveness because you're going to need this. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, what does he say? Forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. It's very Jesus-like language, isn't it? So let me, let me, let me, let me lay this out to you. I'm, there's like this seven steps. They're, they're, they're imperfect as they are, but I think they may be a helpful grid for us to think through. What does it look like to ask for forgiveness? What does it look like to extend forgiveness to, to the goal of complete reconciliation and restoration, okay? The baseline is, if you start at the, at the number zero, is there's gotta be conviction of sin. That like, if you're the one that's hurt someone, like, that you, you need God to convict you, like, that is sin. That you have sinned against God and against your brother or sister in Christ. Like, there's conviction of like, this is not the way of Jesus. This is wronging your brother or sister. And so the baseline is, is, is conviction. But the first step in this stage is, Confession. Confession. There needs to be a confession. Someone taking responsibility for what they have done. Confessing it. And here's what confession is not. Confession is not saying, I'm sorry, I did this to you. Will you forgive me? That's not confession. Think about that. If you're on the receiving end of the hurt, so you already have, you're absorbing the hurt. That's the way it is. You're absorbing the loss of whatever that is. Now they're going to lump on you, I'm sorry, you will you forgive me? They're going to put that on you too. Maybe, maybe because they don't know. And so maybe that's their starting point and maybe that's a good thing. But I think you need a confession. And a confession goes like this. I did this to you. I did this against you. I said this about you. I did these things to you. And it's not followed up with because... Well, you're just a terrible person <laughs> because you said those things to me and you made me do this. You made me say this. That's the way kids ask for forgiveness sometimes. You're not know, careful. Well, I did this because they punched me in the face. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> it's like, hold up. It's confession. I did this. Some of you, like you're, if you've hurt someone, this is, write this down. I did this to you. Second step, compassion. Compassion. When you confess, like, and you need to hear yourself say it. I did this. I would, I bet you, if you're in Christ, there's the probably next thing you may feel is compassion towards the other person you hurt. Because you need, you need to feel that as best you can in a human way, in a proper human way of like, I hurt you. And now for me to say that I hurt you, it hurts me that I hurt you. And now I can sympathize in best of my human ways I can, in proper, appropriate ways, I feel your pain. Like, when I did, like, my God, if someone did that to me, it would crush me. And so now I feel what you have felt. We start to have compassion. That's, I think that's interesting. Paul adds compassion to forgiveness within this. And so you, you may have to enter some of that pain as best you can. Oh, Ty, I just want to say I'm sorry and get it over with. I don't think it's that easy, man, or woman. Well, I don't think it's that easy. Compassion. Christ, Christ, the Bible says, sh shares in our, our pain. I think there's a part of that, that that we need to share in others' pain, especially if we've inflicted it. Number three, repentance. Repentance just means turn. Th that they would turn from their sin. This is where the I sorry I'm coming out. And, it, and it's basically, it's, it's not I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. It becomes not just a behavioral change, it becomes a value change. I'm sorry, I sinned against you. I, I hurt you. I did this to you. I don't want to do it again. I don't want to do it again. But you need to hear this. And hear, this is the fine print of humanity that some of us are not reading. You are in relationship with a sinner. Their job description is they're going to sin. Have you ever been a parent before? 
It's in the job title. You're raising a little sinner. You ever been married before? You're married to a sinner. Not you, baby. Not you. <laughs> Not you. You're the exception, hon. I'm serious. That's my wife over there, if you think, well, who's he pointing at? My wife of 22 years. But you're in a relationship with a sinner, you sinner. And so we sin against one another. I don't know, you know, we, we, we just think like, well, you know, well, they should never do that again. Well, they, sh- they, they should never do that again, sure. And we want them to turn from sin, yes. There's still the ability, as long as you have breath in your lungs, there's the ability to sin. Until you meet Jesus face to face, it's there. That's the risk of relationship. Well, I just won't be in a relationship. Then you will not experience love. Because something about pain and love go together when it comes to relationships. I heard one person say it like this, you cut the cord to pain, you, you cut the nerve to pain, you cut the cord to love. That's very true. And so you want to see re- repentance where the sinner turns. Number four, redemption. Redemption. Listen to me, if, they, if you've been hurt, it may take some time, but you need to offer them some grace. Grace. You've been given grace, right? That's what we saw in the parable. You've received the grace and mercy from God. We said that's one of the major themes. You need to extend some grace to them as well. The idea of redemption is to be bought back. Now, we can't buy someone back. Only Jesus can do that. But we can offer the grace that, you know, as best we can in human ways. We can extend grace to people. They need to know that nothing is beyond God's grace. Even their sin against you is not beyond God's grace. Because your sin against God was not beyond his grace in Christ. See see how this works, this connection? Our our vertical relationship matters to our horizontal relationships. Number five, restitution. Restitution. If something has been robbed from you, you may be able to get it back, but you may not. Some things can't be taken back. They can only be restored by the King Jesus himself. When you meet him face to face and he wipes away every tear and he heals every wound. And some of you may, you may not be able to get back what was taken from you, what someone abused and, and, and they took from you. You may not be able to get it back. Jesus will restore you. Jesus will restore. Hang on for that hope. Hey, like await that good news when you meet him face to face. He will restore you. Some things can If it's money, you can cancel the debt if you want to or it needs to be restored. If it's honor or dignity of some sort, you can cancel that and just, you know, be you and that's fine. Or they may need to go public in some form of the way if they've slandered you or whatever and say, hey, that that was not right. They may, like Facebook's a terrible place. Don't do that on Facebook. Don't do this on Facebook. Attack somebody. Step one, you need to confess, you jerk. Don't do that. Don't do it. Face to face if you can. But they may, need, they may need to pay something back. Don't, don't, make, don't put them in your debt. Don't put them in your debt. You owe me now. And every time they come around you, it's like they owe you money or something. They're just ducking you out all the time. Don't do that. It's not good for your relationship. Number six, reconciliation. It's a process of just warming the relationship back up, that you can be reconciled, that you start to talk, that you start to share meals, that you start to be in some kind of relationship in your work relationship or whatever that you start to reconcile the relationship. You start to make things back together again. And then step seven is just restoration, is that the relationship, the trust as best as you can, you've been restored. Like you were, like you can, here's how, here's a simple way, and this is my, this is my two cents, simple way to know you're restored, you guys can start playing together again. You can have fun together again. That's big in marriage, huge in marriage. Like, when you know you can laugh and play again, there's a part of, like, you know, there's maybe, it's not perfect, but there's a part of, like, we've, we're restored again. We're restored again. See, our goal is to reconcile relationships. That, that's our goal, is to have a heart of forgiveness, to, to, to forgive and to seek forgiveness. I know there's a lot of other things in play, like, Ty, what if they died? And, Ty, what if they did this? And what if they don't think they've hurt me? And what if it's unsafe? I know there's a lot of nuances, but I think Jesus says in, in Matthew 18, 35, so also my heavenly Father will do everything, uh, do everyone, I'm sorry, so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. It's gonna take a lot of death and resurrection in your life, isn't it? 
It's the only way we have forgiveness is the death and resurrection of Christ. There's some things that we'll have to die to. Sometimes our right, sometimes our honor, sometimes our just thing, we'll have to die to some of those things in order to find the life. Because Jesus told us in our death at times we find, we find our life. There's a story I read recently. I'm gonna read it and then I'll finish. This guy was meeting with this other guy. He said, there's no way God can forgive me 100%. And he starts to talk about forgiveness. And this is the story he said. He said, my, Steve, uh, my friend Steve told me up front that he couldn't fathom the concept of forgiveness and being forgiven. As he wolfed down McDonald's filet of fish sandwich, he blurted out, it's like, there you go. He blurted out, Matt, I don't think God could ever forgive me. Okay, maybe he could forgive 70% of my sins, but not all of them. And the writer says, when I tried to explain that Jesus always cleans up the entire load of dirt, as in 100% or nothing, Steve interrupted, yeah, fine, but you don't know the stuff I've done. And then this guy eating this filet fish sandwich told the story. 19 years ago, this guy stole my wife away from me. They got married and moved to Florida while my life unraveled. After I was arrested for assaulting a police officer, the guy smirked through the entire hearing. When I was, convicted, when I was convinced he flipped me the finger during that, I hated him for 19 years. He's coming up here next week. I have a 32 caliber pistol strapped around my ankle, and when I see him, I will kill him. It's a true story. I thought about it. I'm 63 years old. I'll get a life sentence, but I'll also get free medical and dental and a warm bed and three meals a day. It's not a bad way to end my life. And so the author goes on and talks about forgiveness and what that looks like. And then he goes back to the story. He says, that's what I tried to tell Steve, too, about forgiveness. I paused for a long time before I finally stammered, well, I guess it doesn't matter if you go to jail because you're already in jail. You are. You're a prisoner of your own hate, and you're slowly killing yourself. A week later, he called me and said, you know, I get your point. I put the gun away. I don't want to spend the rest of my life in jail, and I want to get rid of bitterness too. Of course, it wasn't my point. It was Jesus' point. Forgiveness, like every other aspect of following Jesus, involves a long journey. Hopefully, by retelling the good news about Jesus, our hearts will start, our hearts will soften, and the spiritual beggar will want to forgive others. We'll want to start the journey, stumbling forward with our hearts both torn by hurt and set free by grace. Slowly before we know it, with Christ alive within us, we'll find more freedom to forgive than we ever could imagine. Jesus said, forgive from your heart. May we be a people, as we look at the debt that was canceled for us by all that Christ has done, may we be a people that extend that grace, mercy, and forgiveness to those who have offended it around us. May we be known, living at the ways of Jesus, as a forgiving people. Let me pray for us. Just as we call you, Father, the only way we truly can is because of all Jesus has done on our behalf, that we may relate and be in relationship with you. And so, Father, for that, we are thankful. God, I know in a room like this, each and every one of us bear the scars and wounds of others. And I also am honest enough to know that we have scarred and wounded others. Father, I also know this, that we await our Savior who will, who will completely restore, renew, and heal those wounds. And yet until then, May we live out the way of Christ and forgive others. I pray for those today that are bitter, holding grudges, in their own prison of unforgiveness. Holy Spirit, may you release them today. Give them a heart of forgiveness. Help them to watch themselves. Help them to talk to the offender. And help them start the process of forgiving. Father, your, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this in Christ's name.